Okay, so this is the chapter 10 existing data analysis um, audio review. Uh, chapter 10 is a little long, so this might be a little long too. I'm going to try and keep it a little brief. So um, chapter is about using data from secondhand sources. Um, so we're going to talk about sources of existing data, analysis of existing statistical data, content analysis, comparative historical analysis, and then of course, like we do with all of them, the strengths and limitations of this approach. All right, so starting out with sources of existing data, you have public documents and official records. So much of written records are contained in archives, and these are just collections that are located in physical or digital libraries. So some of these are going to be government documents, um, which are really a great source of information. As a government, and you know, most if not all governments around the world keep records on all sorts of stuff, which can be used in analysis. Um, there's also official statistics, or what are called in the book vital statistics, um, that can be helpful in sociological research, such as data on birth, death, marriage, divorce, that kind of stuff. Um, also census data is another important resource of demographic info that's used to answer all sorts of research questions, especially in demographic research. So it's been used to study everything from residential mobility, immigration, migration patterns, to racial segregation of neighborhoods. So census data is one of those ones you see a lot in these kinds of methods. Um, private documents are another source of existing data. So these are produced by organizations and individuals for their own use. So clearly these are less accessible than those public documents and official records. So you would need a group, organization, or individual's permission to use and analyze that data. So the book gives an example of research on hiring discrimination that used a company's internal database, but the private documents or institutional records can be used to supplement other research methods, such as survey data, right? Giving an example where researchers were trying to study college students' alcohol consumption, and so as part of it, they asked the participants to give them access to their college records so they could use their SAT scores and other info as variables to differentiate participants. Um, another source of existing data is the mass media. At least this one's my favorite. Just kind of an excuse to watch TV or <laughs> watch a movie or read a magazine. Um, so books, newspaper, magazines, TV, radio, films, internet, right? All of these things can be used in so many different ways to understand different items of analyses. It really just depends on which one you pick just to answer all sorts of kind of questions you might have. So the book gives some examples and we're going to get more in depth into this one later on. Um, there's also physical uh, nonverbal evidence. So this could be like a uh, work of art, right? Or clothing or just all sorts of kind of artifacts that, you know, human people make. So um, sometimes um, when you see these kind of um, methods, this is often used in stuff that's like anthropological, right? Where they're trying to look at a culture by understanding their cave drawings, right? Or understanding a cultural moment by looking at an art movement, right? Um, so the book gives an interesting example of a researcher who used trash as a way to understand household consumer behavior. I'm sure that wasn't super fun <laughs> to do. Um, and then there's also social science uh, data archives, and thankfully there are, because these are just the best. Um, so these are data from surveys, field research, in-depth interviews. Basically, it's a database of previous research data that can be used for other research studies. So much of this research is what we call secondary analysis. And there's various available sources like the Pew Research Center or the GSS, you know, known as the General Social Survey, where they do surveys on the same questions over time. And you can use that info to see how your perceptions or understandings have changed on a certain topic that you're interested in studying. Another good one they talk about in the book is the ICPSR or the, you know, um, Inter-University Consortium for Political and social research, which again, just compiles all sorts of independent studies into a usable database. So meaning you get raw data that you can download and you can put into a program like SPSS. Um, so if you had to do a research project in a stats course, you'd probably use these resources or heard of them before because you don't have the time to collect the data yourself. So you would use these kind of resources to practice statistical analysis. All right, so analysis of existing statistics. So um, 
when you first, you know, the first one they talk about is the analysis of vital statistics, the census data and other governmental stuff. So you get the data from one of these sources, the raw data, right? And then you get to use it to answer your research questions by, again, inputting it into a program like SPSS and then running certain, um, you know, tests to kind of, again, depending on what your unit of analysis and depending on what your research question is, like what you're looking at, um, you would kind of compare the variables um, in order to see if there's relationships between your independent and dependent variables. So um, this is the primary method of demography, is analysis of existing statistics. So demography studies the structure and changes in human populations. You know, demographers are the exciting people who turn stats into findings. So they examine the size, composition, and geographical distribution of populations. And this they usually do by, you know, statistics on birth, death, marriage, illness, migration, geographical fun stuff, just all sorts of stuff. And the internet is increasingly a rich source of existing statistics as well. So, you know, um, there are like these, right here you have this uh, table 10.1 from your book, some sources of existing official statistics to give you an example. Shows a bunch of the most popularly used sources and what they're used for. So if you did research in medical sociology, then a source like the CDC that looks at illnesses and injuries is a good place to go. So again, what source you use is gonna have to do with what kind of research questions you have. So to illustrate how this works, there are some research studies that the chapter talks about that will demonstrate this. All right, so this is one of the studies that was done and it just gives me an excuse to talk about a show that I watched way too much of. So <laughs> fun fact, well, not fun, but a fact uh, that while in recent years, the teen pregnancy rate has dropped, meaning since the 1990s, when you look at rates of teen pregnancy in the US, we still have high, much higher rates than those in devel other developed nations. The biggest rate drop since the 90s was between 2008 and 2012 which happens to be when the show 16 and Pregnant was on TV. So naturally researchers wondered if there could be a relationship between the drop in teen pregnancies and the TV show that focused on the lives and struggles of teen moms. So to do this, they examined four sources of statistics. First, they looked at the Nielsen ratings of television viewing audiences. So if you're not aware, there are these families that are called Nielsen families who get a little meter on their TV that tracks what they watch. And they pick a small representational sample of families to try and understand and represent how families are watching TV in the US. So that's you know the first place that they're getting their stats. The second one was Google Trends. So Google uses an index to measure trends in usage. So they used people searching, you know, the quote 16 and pregnant and um, terms related to contraceptive use like, you know, quote, how to get birth control, um, how to get abortion. Um, you know, things like that. And then the third source that they used were Twitter records. So basically, whatever's tweeted is kept in a library of past tweets. So they could look at the tweets at the same search criteria that they use for the Google Trends and see, you know, if that related to when the show was on. And then they could also, their, the last one they looked at was microdata on um, live births in the US. So again, from the CDC, um, the Centers for Disease Control, they use the CDC to break down birth rates by age group and by country. Also, they measured the months of conception and the lengths of gestation is also available in the data so that they could kind of be a little more specific about when it was on and when people were getting pregnant. <laughs> so interestingly, the data showed, you know, their first question was, you know, was the show popular? Well, the show was popular, especially among young women, which again, I, I personally watched way too much of it. <laughs> and what I found interesting is that the ratings tended to be the highest in areas of the country with relatively high rates of teen pregnancy. So maybe people could kind of relate, right, to what they were seeing. Um, the second research question that they had was whether the show had an impact on teen pregnancy rates. And as they talked about, teen birth rates did decline in the third quarter after the show aired, but birth rates did not decrease for older age groups. So that kind of leads them to wonder if, you know, if the teen birth rate is dropping just during this time period, but not the birth rate overall, that there may be a relationship 
that they're seeing there. And then the third question they asked was about the impact of the show on activities that could account for the decline in teen pregnancy. So meaning, you know, while the show is on, were there more searches on Google or were there more comments on Twitter about birth control and abortion? Um, so searches and tweets on contraceptive use and abortion increased immediately after the show aired. So they do think that there was some sort of relationship that they could at least argue based on this kind of content analysis. So we're going to look a little bit more specifically at the Google trend part of this. So really they looked at, again, breaking down one specific part of this was the Google trends. So the earliest peak correspondence was when the show first ran um, in 20, uh, 2009, but viewership eventually waned and the show did not appear for a year. But their final peak came in about 2014 um, when the show revived for a fifth season. So you can see the literal interest over time graph right here um, from the Google Trends. So again, this, they did this to address the research question as to if watching the show affected how teens understood teen pregnancy and the need for using birth control. So they searched the popularity of the show, but they also looked at how this related to searches about birth control and abortion as well. So it's a pretty interesting way to do research. And Google Trends have been analyzed to look at all sorts of kinds of things and patterns and issues and the trends and how people are interacting with a lot of different variables. So using existing data means you can skip the design and collecting part of the research and kind of move on to the actual analysis stuff. Okay, so you gotta find your info, right? So the first challenge in existing data research is finding existing statistics or other research that, you know, procuring data that's relevant, right? Especially to your specific research question. So your research question should guide the search for appropriate data. Obviously, previous studies may suggest possible data sources or give you an idea of how others use info to get their findings, but you might have to tweak or change those things a little bit to make them fit the scope of what you're looking at. So government data, meaning, again, like the example that they gave in the uh, 16 and Pregnant one, birth data from the CDC, is mandated for public use without restrictions. So like we talked about before, getting that info, super easy, right? Um, well, I mean, as far as it's cheap, because it's just available. And um, you don't have to go through a lot of hurdles to get it. Versus that private or confidential records, like the Nielsen records, right? Um, or the Twitter data. Um, again, Twitter data, Facebook data, you know, there's been a lot about um, Cambridge Analytica and Facebook. Um, you know, those kind of understandings of taking people's information without letting them know, those are supposed to be confidential records, right? While Facebook, Twitter, any of these things, you agree to them monitoring what you do when you are using their application, um, those documents or those kind of understandings should not be just available to the general public, right? So um, it can be costly and difficult to manage, just meaning, again, unless you're a Cambridge Analytica who just stole thousands of Facebook users' personal data. But remember, how did they do that? They did it because um, they, it's interesting. So anyway, um, the whole point of why they did it was they wanted to um, take people's personal data to target advertisements towards them to sway public opinion in favor of Donald Trump. But um, most of us, you know, it's really, again, interestingly, most of us are not using those third party apps, but the group Cambridge Analytica actually bought the info from a researcher who had gotten access via a third party app. So, you know, those weird surveys, you know, um, it's like, which character, which Harry Potter character are you, or what your birth month says about you, or some other such nonsense. Um, you have to agree to let them see your info or your friends list or other crap like that so you can see, again, what Harry Potter character you are or whatever. So um, that's actually how they gained access to that information. But again, um, the idea is that if you get these kind of personal and confidential records, you gotta pay for it. So if you wanna do research with these things, that's fine. It just might take a little more time and be a little bit more cumbersome a process than using the government or public data, which again is why you just see people using a lot of those ones. Um, when it comes to measuring variables and evaluating data, existing data may provide indirect, imperfect measures of data. So, or a variable, sorry. So this is why you need to be careful what you're measuring, um, you know, what, what, what your unit of analysis is. So since the original research was not done to your specific research question, the data might not be as accurate or at least is imperfect, right? When it comes to your variables so that, you know, um, 
you have linked to someone's previous measure that might not completely fit. So we'll talk about what happens when it doesn't. So um, sometimes data is only available in aggregate form, and this presents problems in drawing conclusions about individual behavior. Um, there's also the issue of ecological fallacies. So these are just those erroneous inferences about an individual based on data that describes an aggregate of which the individual is a member. So this just means that you can't always make conclusions that a specific person will do something, but more accurately, they may be more likely to do something. Um, or when you make assumptions that uh, because you have one finding, that means something specific about individuals in that group or area. So the book gives a classic example of the ecological fallacy from the political research on George Wallace, um, which if you don't know him, he was a segregationist and all around terrible human person who ran for president in 1968. Um, so these political scientists decided to see who was voting for him, you know, what patterns they could find. So this is where the assumptions came in because they found that the higher the percentage of black voters in a district, the more votes Wallace received. So you could then say, well, that must mean that they're African-Americans that are voting for him, which again, makes kind of no sense since he was a segregist uh, segregationist and kind of racist AF. So the assumptions based on the data would be wrong. But the reality was that the more black people living in these southern voting districts, then white voters were more likely to support Wallace than those living in more white neighborhoods. So that's actually what, what is happening in there. So again, the ecological fallacy is when you find one finding and assume something on it that isn't necessarily an accurate reflection of what's going on within the overall group, right? So to evaluate, you must determine so far as possible how, when, where, by whom the data was collected. You have to reconstruct how the data was collected by the original research so that you can understand the data in context. And of course, to make sure that the information is valid and reliable. So um, data evaluation may lead to data refinement. So maybe the way they define a variable is different than your analysis. So you might have to change some stuff uh, before you use their data and infer things incorrectly. All right, so a content analysis is a more specific version of this. This is a systematic analysis of the symbolic content of communication. So the goal of a content analysis is to understand the messages being sent to others and how this may affect the audience in their perceptions and understandings. So what you do is you take whatever your source is and you boil the information down into themes or what we've talked about before, coded variables that help you identify those arguments in the content. So this includes printed matter, oral recordings, visual communications, works of art, all sorts of stuff, right? Um, and may be applied to existing data or to coding of open-ended questions, field notes, and transcribed interviews. So the way you can go about it specifically is quite varied. And as all the things depend on your research question, it can also be reflective of your specific chosen unit of analysis. So it can be an analysis of printed info, like a recording, or newspaper or art itself, but a content analysis can also be applied to the analysis of open-ended questions. So you know those boxes on a survey that say something like, if you answered yes, please explain below. Right? Those questions can't be quantified in an automatic way that a survey scale can be quantified. So sometimes those things will be coded themselves for like what themes are people saying within this survey. So sometimes um, coding happens within those contexts as well. And again, um, this may be quantitative or qualitative, so we'll talk about that. And this may involve either manual or computer coding. So manual coding is much more common than computer coding. So the example they use in the chapter goes into how they coded, so you can get a better understanding of how manual coding works. Um, so we'll get into the example of that. So, um, you know, at the beginning of the Iraq war, the US military introduced a program where journalists were, um, that were covering the war could be embedded with military units, meaning they dress like them, they lived with them. So that's what embedded means, right? So as you can assume, this may affect how you see their experiences. So researchers were interested how this could affect the way that reporters write their stories. So their question was, um, how, do re how do journalists' vantage points affect the stories they write? So to understand this, they um, analyzed five randomly selected print articles by 156 journalists. And from this, they coded 16 different variables 
right again looking for themes and patterns you find all these distinct ones which became their 16 different coded variables five of which um, were on the coverage of coalition soldiers experiences five on the coverage of Iraqi experience so um, and again they were looking at how the articles reflected vantage point so they found that um, embedded journalists were more likely to cover a soldier's experience because, duh, they're <laughs> with the soldiers. Um, Baghdad journalists were more likely to cover Iraqi experiences. And independent journalists like uh, the wonderful man Jeremy Scahill, pictured here at the top, um, my future husband, um, independent journalists like him are more balanced, right? Because while they're reporting from the ground, they're not embedded with the troops, so they're not seeing it from the troops' point of view. They're not embedded on the ground, so they're not necessarily seeing it from the Iraqis' point of view. They're more detached, so they're able to kind of get a more balanced approach to some of these reporting. So these are the variables from the Iraq War study, just to give you an idea of how they have their independent variables, what's the vantage point, and their dependent variables and control variables were pretty important to how all of this is coded, right? Again. Um, they're looking at the coalition soldiers' experiences, the coverage of Iraqi experience, and, um, you know, again, controlling for gender, nationality, prominence of news agency, length of article, and publication date. So that's just to give you an idea of a way that this is, could be used um, in practice. Okay, so, um, like I said, a whole bunch of times, the initial steps in a content analysis depends on the research question, which is going to tell you what kind of sources are applicable to answer your questions. So sources include verbal and nonverbal materials like we talked about before. Print and broadcast media could be some, web pages, uh, photos, videos, music, basically anything that has been or can be recorded, <laughs> right, um, could be, uh, you know, communication units to study. So you know, units of analysis and content analysis are pretty different from other methodologies. It's important to define if you're looking at articles like the example in the book, then are you using certain words or certain phrases or paragraphs as your unit of analysis. It has to be very, very clarified. So there's two uh, primary types of units, sampling units and recording units. So sampling units is the basis for identifying and sampling the target population. So meaning um, the sampling units for the example one from the book would be all published reports on the Iraq war, right? And recording units, otherwise known as coding units, um, are the part of the communication that's a basis for coding. Meaning, are you looking at the entire report? Are you looking at just an article? Are you looking at just paragraphs or just certain phrases or whatever, right? So in the book's example, these things end up being the same um, but there are a lot of different cases in research where these things are different in nuanced ways. All right, so next up, you got to develop a coding scheme. So what does that even mean? Um, it's just the uh, developing a coding scheme is really operationalizing the variables in your hypothesis. So you're going to list all of your variables and the codes to be applied. And it's kind of like a list of close-ended questions in survey research, right? Instead of asking a person as you would have done in a survey, you apply that question to the document itself, whether it's a newspaper, like the example, um, or it could be like a video, a song, whatever your unit of analysis is. Then you could code it for like a one for yes or zero for no, um, like the example in the chapter. So types of variable coding um, there are time space measures, so um, time or space devoted to the topic is really what that means. So an example um, in a newspaper would be maybe column inches, or one that comes to my brain was the amount of time candidates recovered during the 2016 election, right? Like a lot of research looked at how Bernie Sanders re received only a few minutes of coverage um, on most mainstream networks while hours and hours of coverage were focused on Trump. <laughs> actually was really interesting in the research study that I read. They said that th there was actually more footage of an empty podium of Trump about to speak than there was of Bernie Sanders during the entire campaign. So that's interesting. Kind of shows you how time and space measures within, within this kind of coding. So um, again, that obviously can affect voter perceptions or the likelihood of a candidate will win. So what information you have about a person um, is part of that too. So time space measures are just very common in content analysis because you're looking at um, you know how much time or space was devoted to one thing appearance um, this is the presence or absence of a message 
right? So um, let's say you're looking for something that um, promotes, I don't know, uh, alcoholism or promotes, um, I don't know, drug use or something like that. Like, let's say you're looking at music genres and you're saying, well, which music genres are promoting drug use? So in a song, if you're coding, um, you know, or if you were kind of trying to look through that specific song, you would say, does it have a pro um, drug use message? Does it not? Right? That's kind of the way you would code these things. Um, frequency, obviously, kind of straightforward. It's just the frequency of content, meaning how likely a word appears. Or um, another content analysis example I used in my own research was how media covers female and male politicians very differently, um, meaning they're more likely to use negative adjectives to female lawmakers than males. So they'd say, like, the male candidate said or stated, while the female candidate complained. <laughs> right? So this, of course, can affect how people understand and interpret politicians. So frequency is one of the ways that this is measured or understood. And then intensity, um, the valence, right? The, is, it, is it negative? Is it neutral? Is it positive? Right? So um, of what's actually going on in the content. So of course, this is going to have to do with the content you're looking at. The book example is if you're looking for, again, messages about drugs and music, is the reference negative, positive, or neutral? So like, obviously some, some genres of music are very pro-drug use. Some are pretty neutral or say nothing at all. <laughs> and some are actually quite negative against it. So again, that's how you would understand um, the intensity, right? It's just how often these things are, the kind of prevalence of how this is working. Um, so from these kind of uh, types of variable coding, an analysts construct either a code book for manual coding or a dictionary for computer coding. So codebook, again, is your shorthand for the subtopics that you're looking at and how they're labeled in the data so that they can be compiled together to be looked at in full. This also helps others understand, you know, and use your research later or verify your research independently to see how you labeled or coded and measured the data. A dictionary is used in computer coding. Um, typically, this searches for phrases or parts of speech um, and such in a large data set. Um, and there'd be a lot of them for each major variable in the research. Sometimes these are just ways to sort and organize phrases or terms in order to relate them to each other. So using, let's say, the code excellent, right, to stand in for a bunch of other related terms like fantastic, magnificent, terrific, as they explained in the chapter. Um, so I'm going to show you an excerpt just to explain this a little bit more. Okay, so this is an excerpt from a code book. So um, this is just to show you how they constructed their codebook using brief codes to represent overall issues and themes that they're looking for in their content analysis. So this way you can nearly standardize the information to measure it more effectively and to be able to represent it, you know, as graphs, charts, tables, etc. All right, so moving on to sampling units. Um, when it comes to sampling, it's complicated for a lot of reasons. So first, there may be more than one unit to sample. Um, sometimes not all the data is going to relate to your research question, meaning you're looking for certain things like needles in a haystack, which can cause a lot of complications. And you're not trying to make statistical inferences, so figuring out how to analyze a document or picture or whatever it is you're looking at, instead of looking for a pattern or trend, the key is to select a manageable amount of info to look at. Um, you know, enough that can answer your research question. So you, maybe you're using newspapers to understand how a certain topic is understood in the culture. But to do so, you have to pick a reasonable time frame, right? So a content analysis may sample sources like newspapers, you know, types of newspapers, um, documents like a specific issue of a newspaper, right? Or text and images within a document, which this could be like a certain page of a newspaper or a photograph within there. Um, and to do this, they may use purposive or probability sampling. So some of this is purposive where you pick specific text or images for the analysis. And often this is because what you're looking for has to be specific. So you're selective in what you choose for your analysis. While others use probability sampling where you pull in a bunch of data and randomly select a portion of it for review. So the example in the book that makes this clear is where they're studying violence on TV. They grabbed a large, large uh, portion of data from early morning to late evening programs for 20 weeks. And of all of that, they randomly selected chunks of those programs to analyze 
by doing it that way, it's a reflection of the overall content without having to like literally sit through 20 weeks of <laughs> morning to evening analysis, which would just take forever, right? Um, there's also, um, you know, messages or message archives like LexisNexis that they talk about in the chapter um, that may serve as sampling frames for selecting units. This is an advantage of living in a time with more access to technology, right? Um, finding archives of info without having to physically travel to a location and look through archives is just, wow, we have no idea. You don't have to go there physically and look through their card catalog or a physical log that takes time and energy. Thankfully, there are these wonderful human beings that are called archiv archivists, I almost said that wrong, um, who scan and digitize older records so that they can be preserved and available to the public, and especially through the internet, um, which is much more convenient for researchers and really opens up all sorts of access to materials that can answer a myriad of research questions. So LexisNexis is one they talk about that has a bunch of magazines and newspapers, and there's others that you have access to through the school library. Plus on the internet, you can find all sources of digital content like older programs, political ads, films, even commercials, right? They could always be sources that you could sample from. So some research is done by one person, so it's fairly straightforward how the coding's developed and agreed upon because you just develop it and agree upon it yourself, right? But in larger studies like the one on violence and TV that they talked about in the chapter, they're undertaken by multiple researchers, often grad students, <laughs> or other people that are training in research. So this that means they have to do the tedious parts. So in those cases, you have to make sure everyone's on the same page and understands what's being looked for and how these things should be coded so that they work together systematically. So this applies only to manually coded content analysis, right? Um, because obviously if you're using the computer dictionary, that's kind of does that part for you. And then those are different kinds of things you're looking at. So um, this usually has two reliability checks. Um, first is a pilot test to make sure that the coding scheme is adequate. So you can practice and use the pilot test as an opportunity to see what works, right? Find any potential problems before you go through all the data, because then you would have to start again. So in the book, they talked about uh, how researchers who would pilot test by coding like a small percentage of the articles, like maybe 10% of them, um, to, that could be analyzed overall just to make sure that those codes are enough or maybe they they are mutually exclusive enough or anything like that just to find the errors before you do all the work and then later say oh you know this code doesn't make sense I'm gonna compile it with this other one or I'm gonna add another code and then you'd have to start all over and go all the way back through everything so that's not good so um, the other one is a final check on reliability based on the analysis so you learn from the pilot study right and that's when or the pilot test so that's when um, you change things a little bit before the next check so this is the final opportunity to make sure it's right so think about it like a paper you're writing you want to revise it and revise it to make sure you get it right so you want to do the same thing with coding all right once you get to carrying out the analysis the first step is to code the sample material so manual coding may use a coding book like a code book like I showed you the example of right where you create these little um, you know abbreviations for the different things you're looking for um, but also there's the computer coding which is usually uh, those dictionaries or different software programs um, most of which again have pre-programmed settings of vocabulary to kind of measure that stuff for you so the second step is to actually analyze this stuff so first you want to summarize the message content in terms of patterns and trends so you relate the content variables to one another or some other variable, meaning, you know, like the journalistic vantage point one example from the book. So they're supposed to be mutually exclusive categories that you use to label your findings. Then you can start to look deeper and see which demographic groups have which patterns once you set up the codes, meaning you could compare men and women on the responses. Or in the example in the chapter, you can compare journalists who are embedded with the military versus those who are independent or those who are reporting for the local area. This is how you can make your claims of difference in, and importance um, in how different codes are related to participant responses. Okay, so comparative historical analysis. So using comparative historical analysis was something that a lot of the founders of the discipline of sociology did in their own research, like Weber and Marx, right? Um, their methods also involved systematic comparisons of small sets of cases 
alongside their historical analyses. So Marx, for example, you know, um, he used his historical analysis to link the feudal era where kings and queens ruled and the serfs toiled. Um, you know, the serfs, their whole point was to make it easy for the royal class. Um, he really analyzed that to the more modern industrial era that he argued the capitalists have become the feudal kings and queens, right? As they control the companies and make the profits while the workers labor for pennies and their work leads to extreme wealth of capitalists. Though this is a super oversimplification of what he said, <laughs> right? like super oversimplified version of what he actually said. But yeah, he used this type of method to develop his theories that eventually became the basis for, you know, uh, what we now know as conflict theory. So, um, in comparative historical analysis, is this uses primarily to develop causal explanations for real-world social transformations. So in a book I use in my criminology class, it's kind of related to the example from the book we'll talk about in a minute. Um, the book I use in my crim class called New Jim Crow is where Michelle Alexander is trying to draw a link through some of, the, of her historical analysis, in her case using the legal system and court cases that she connects the racial caste system of slavery to Jim Crow segregation and how the institution of slavery went away, but racism didn't. It just changed. So then she argues that the system of segregation morphed into what we now see in mass incarceration today. So this is one example of how this works, right? The goal is to understand how history has taken place and what factors or issues have motivated the historical changes that we see with our view of hindsight. So. We'll talk about the book example, which also deals with the emergence of mass imprisonment. So um, when it comes to comparative historical analysis, it involves two types of systemic comparisons. You have your between case comparisons and between historical periods comparisons. So this usually involves a small number of similar and contrasting cases and is ordinarily based on the analysis of existing data. So we're going to get into a specific example from the book. So, um, you know, for a hundred years, incarceration rates in the U.S. stayed about the same, which was, you know, um, maybe a hundred inmates for every hundred thousand people. But in the last quarter of the 20th century, AKA since the seventies, basically, um, late seventies, there was a massive increase in the number of people behind bars. So researchers decided to use historical analysis to understand it. And they asked their research question was, what accounts for the significant increase in U.S. incarceration in the last quarter of the 20th century? So other countries in the Western world dealt with a lot of the same historical factors, but you don't see their prison populations exploding like ours did. So to develop an understanding, the researchers did a content analysis of penal development and politics from 1960 to 2001. They analyzed national data as well as eight specific states, Arizona, California, Florida, Oregon, Minnesota, New York, Texas, and Washington, which I'm saying quickly because you don't need to really know or memorize that. It's just to give you an idea of how they set up their analysis. Also, they analyzed three historical periods, um, which they, they deemed um, destabilization to be 1960 to 1975, um, contestation to be 1975 to 1992, and Reconstruction to be 1992 to 2001. So they generally found an interaction among the type of crime politics and the definition of the crime problem and crime policies. So during that destabilization period, what they labeled 1960 to 1975, crime entered the national spotlight in some ways as a reaction to civil rights and other social unrest. So think about what that means, <laughs> right? People of color, women, environmental, and anti-war activists were fighting for what they believed in by using civil disobedience. So breaking the law in peaceful ways like sit-ins, teach-ins, lunch counter strikes, marches, protests, a lot of crime narratives came out of this era. And you know, the older, more privileged generation was in fear of the changes that could happen by giving people of color, women, and these other groups rights. So during this time, you have candidates like George Wallace, right, which we talked about a minute ago, who called for segregation to remain in place, as well as using the rhetoric of, hint, you might have heard of it somewhat recently, law and order, which is a dog whistle that communicates racial and other marginalized groups will not dictate policy. Meaning, especially when it comes to civil rights, white people were scared. So saying you're going to bring law and order is a nicer way of saying we're going to make sure these African-Americans, women's, 
you know, gays, anti-war and environmental activists stay in their place and do not reap the benefits of American society. So during the late 60s, a crime bill was passed giving money to states for enforcement. And Reagan, during this time period um, when he was governor of California, he linked protesting to crime and closed colleges to stop protests. You know, especially a focus on Berkeley and their um, free speech movement at the time. So that destabilization time period led to the contestation, the second phase, right, um, which they deem 1975 to 92. Um, and this is, you know, Reagan goes from, you know, governor, uh, well, first he goes from acting alongside a chimpanzee to governor, <laughs> to then president, uh, becoming president. And so again, he puts a ton of money in the war on drugs. He changes the focus from the war on drugs from prevention and treatment to just enforcement, predominantly enforcement. So the war on drugs resulted in the creation of mandatory minimum prison sentences where judges lose their discretion to choose a sentence based on the facts of the case. Uh, Reagan also used the law and order rhetoric to get elected and reelected. So the first two phases led to a new penal order, right? So then from you know, 92 to 2001, you get to this third phase where the laws become worse and three strikes laws come into effect where the third time you're charged with a crime, um, you could get 30 to life or 25 to life. And in California, we made our third strike any crime, not just a violent felony, which exploded the prison population in California. So researchers say in the third era, it became the political norm that we're tough on crime, whether or not it's effective at actually stopping crime or lowering crime rates or, you know, um, stopping victimization of people. Um, it became a political necessity to say you're tough on crime. Right. So, again, that's the, the research in the book that they use as an example, just to give you an idea of how these things can actually work in practice. OK, so when it comes to selecting compiling case studies, Initially, researchers usually select on the dependent variable, so meaning you want to select cases with the same outcome. So comparative researchers tend to ask why particular transformations occur, which focuses on attention, you know, on the presence of an outcome. So they're going to start by selecting the dependent variable because by studying cases that um, have the same outcome, they can then search for relevant commonalities. You know, this is how you strengthen inferences. You select cases that vary by size, by region, by political and penal history. So, you know, that example that I just gave you, um, they were, they didn't just look at one thing, like one time era or, you know, um, one understanding or one state, right? They looked at all sorts of different kind of things. So their case selection is driven by the research topic and their analytical framework. So later phases may select relevant negative cases as part of theory testing. So to strengthen your argument, sometimes you're gonna look at the negative cases that actually help you validate the positive ones. Kind of like in a lit review where you bring up a counter argument to yours, but then you use your argument to argue against it. So the cases they look at in general can provide insight that can contribute to theory building. And the choice of cases is driven by theory and availability of cases. So a lot of what they're using is info from historians or archival research. So there's some practical considerations that dictate the use of existing in-depth case studies. Alrighty, so as far as conducting within case analyses, the first step in comparative historical analysis is when researchers create a narrative or timeline of events within each case. So each narrative provides a chronological account or understanding of the process that led to the changes. So process analysis is used when identifying intervening links between phenomena. So in the book example, researchers linked the political strategy of law and order, right, and the creation and promotion of the war on drugs as linked to the issues of rapid increase in the number of people that are incarcerated. All right, moving on to conducting cross-case analyses. So the comparison of cases begins with the analysis of each case study. Noting the similarities and differences in the individual cases, these cross-case analyses may use Boolean algebra and truth tables for causal analysis. So I know, you tuned out when I said algebra. But it's kind of interesting, <laughs> bear with me. So they turn these non-mathematical categories, your codes, into dichotomies that can be measured in a mathematical context. So if you use a variable of gender in a, let me, let me preface this, in a um, 
dichotomous understanding of gender, though gender is not dichotomous, it's a social construct. Anywho, um, so let's say you turn gender into a dichotomy, <laughs> right? as society has. Um, so if you use the variable of gender and you set men as zero and women as one, that can be represented in a table, right? That can be turned into a mathematical representation, even though it's a code which isn't necessarily mathematical on its own. So they're called truth tables, which is a data matrix that represents all possible combinations of values for a set of causal variables. So in a truth table, you got your variables and columns that are coded as present or absent. You got your rows that represent all possible combinations of those different causal variables and the outcome variable is coded as present or absent based on data from the all cases. So meaning if something is present, you get the one. If it's absent, it's a zero, right? It's pretty straightforward in that way. So it also may use narrative comparison. So this means identifying causal patterns across cases and then checking against each case. So if the researcher goes back and looks at the sequence of events across cases to determine if the cases follow a similar causal process. So again, I know that can be a little bit <laughs> right? a little a little much, especially once I start talking about algebra and tables and things like that. But this is really interesting in the way that it's kind of like the nitty gritty and how you turn your information into something that can actually be analyzed and represent, uh, represented in a table format. So um, when it comes to the strengths, you know, even though uh, one of the main goals of sociological research is to study society and social change, the majority of research methods actually focus on individuals, you know, such as surveys or interviews that compile individual information. So rarely is the unit of analysis a group or a portion of history. Plus, it's really hard to do research on something that's over like 50 years old using most of those methods, um, like the book says. You could interview people that were alive back then, but memory is malleable and it would not be as valid. So the ability to study social structure, history and social change is a big part of what sets existing data analysis apart from many other research methods. So existing data often describes larger social units, like comparing different societies or different eras from one culture. So the only means of studying the distant past and long-term social change is really these kinds of you know, methods. So there's longitudinal research that looks at changes over time, but most of those studies didn't start until the last quarter of the 20th century, meaning the info doesn't go back far enough for us to understand some of the historical time periods that really weren't that long ago, um, but really do lend an understanding to what happens today, right? So like the example talking about um, mass incarceration, right? Changes in the political understandings of the 1960s and 70s because of the civil rights movements and other rights movements change something completely different, which is, you know, um, our explosion of mass incarceration. So it's interesting how looking at those kind of things, you can start to find how history got to where it is now, right? Um, and another huge strength, you know, is non-reactive measurement. So we know that there's this issue of the Hawthorne effect in research, right? Or reactivity, where people change their behavior when they know they're being observed or researched. So a big advantage of existing data analysis is it's non-reactive. You're dealing with data that's from the past and it's not going to affect it, um, you know, because it's not being observed in real time. Also, there's a huge benefit of the cost efficiency. So you can economize on cost, time, and personnel, depending on your unit of analysis, of course, or how extensive your research is. It's typically much cheaper in approach and a quicker one at generating information. So the cost per case is much lower than surveys and experiments, which again, is a big advantage of the approach, especially as a lot of academics live in a, what we call publish or perish reality. Being able to answer a research question with one of these approaches can be a quick way to find out some interesting info and get something published. Some of the weaknesses, um, like I said, every method has strengths and weaknesses. Um, so the major challenge is finding data appropriate for answering your research questions you're not collecting it yourself. So you're stuck with what already exists out there. And if the info is limited or not completely available or not completely relevant to your analysis, then you may not get the right information or satisfy your inquiries. So in the book, they compare using these kind of methods with wearing someone else's shoes. So they could fit well, but in reality, they never quite fit right, right? So finding the right info to answer your questions can be a huge limitation of this of this approach, right? Or these approaches.
Um, so data may also be incomplete or unrepresentative. So there's different reasons for why this is, and most of it is what they call selective survival or selective deposit. So selective survival just means some objects survive longer than others. So the book talks about anthropologists who often study bones or like look at people's pottery, right? <laughs> but this is because of selective survival. Those are the things that last the longest versus like bits of wood or paper or other things decay sooner. So um, that's why anthropologists had to study what they study because that's what lasts. So they have this selective survival of certain things last the test of time and that's all they can look at, right? So um, when it comes to written records, there's also the issue of selective deposit, which is the editing or destruction that may create bias in the historical written record. So some records are destroyed. So take, for example, government records. Not all information is kept forever, especially before a lot of our information was digitized. Uh, people only had so much space to keep paper files. So they periodically destroy records while some records remain. So not to mention fires or issues like that that have caused gaps in the records that exist officially. Um, plus, there are some records that are edited and therefore they might not be an accurate representation of what happened at the time. So this missing info is a major limitation of these methodological approaches. So again, there's always uh, some strengths, some weaknesses when it comes to any research methodology, uh, but this one is really just a fact that sometimes the information just isn't as accurate as it purports to be.